Well, welcome to our series, Life in 10 Words. Before we get started, if you have a social media account through Facebook, would you take out your phone, share the live stream that's happening right now, check in there, and invite your friends, not just to our Facebook page, but also to come and be a part of what God is doing here in the church. So this morning, I want to start out by sharing a story, but I need to share it from three different perspectives. And I want to start with the one I know the best, which was my own. So it's a Sunday morning. It's about eight or so years ago. And my wife and I are getting ready for church. When she looks at me and she says, Lee, I don't feel well. I don't know if I can go today. And so we talk back and forth. I try and convince her, babe, we, we only have one car. Once I leave, I can't come back and get you. She says, no, you, I, I really don't feel well. I think I need to lay down. And so my wife lays down, I go to church, and this happened to be a Sunday where, uh, as the youth pastor at the time, I was doing the communion moment. And so I'm standing up there, and I begin the whole, you know, on the evening that Christ was betrayed, and as soon as I start talking, my cell phone starts going off. Now, luckily, while it was in my pocket, it was on vibrate, but even still, I'm standing there going, and then Jesus broke the bread, and it rings again, and then he gave the cup, and I'm just I'm pressing the button over and over again, and whoever's on that other line, they don't understand or respect the moment that I'm having with the church right there. So, after I get done administering the communion leading into that moment, I snuck out. We had hallways along the side here of the sanctuary, so I snuck out, and I look, and I see it's my wife, and I had missed like 10 calls, and my wife doesn't normally call me repeatedly. Like, she'll call me twice, and then she'll leave me alone if I don't answer, and so I, I try and call her, and there's no response. I try and call a second time, there's no response. And so now I'm starting to get in my head like, oh my goodness, what is going on? And so I just so happened to see the senior pastor who was out there, you know, looking at his notes. We don't, we don't ever do that. We don't look at our notes at all. Uh, looking at the notes, I said, Dave, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on, but I have to go home. He said, don't worry, go. And so I drive home. And as I'm pulling up, I see police vehicles all around my house and an officer is staking a perimeter, looking around the yard. Renee's side of the story. She's got to stay home that Sunday. She doesn't feel well. Her husband is less than understanding about the fact that she's going to be missing church. And so she lays down. She covers herself up with a blanket and just passes out, goes to sleep. About an hour later, she hears this noise, kind of a rustling at our bedroom window. And you need to understand, at the time, we had three cats. Two of those cats we chose. One of those cats literally walked in our front door one day and just never left. So, and these cats like to play in the blinds. And so she had this thought. She said, I'm going to get even with them. So she slinked out of bed, got down on the floor, and carefully moved her way over to the window. And then she kind of crouched and grabbed just the very bottom of the blind and went, what are you doing? The third perspective. An unnamed man about five, six, five, seven is in our neighborhood, and he happens to notice that our house doesn't have a vehicle parked in front of it. Uh, he notices that there's no you know, activity going on that's visible, and so he happens to see that around the side of the house there's a window that looks accessible. So he goes up to it, he looks around, he's not sure, but you know, making sure nobody's around and doesn't see anybody, so he takes what looked to be a small crowbar and kind of started prying off the screen to our window, making a little rustling noise that sounded perhaps like cats playing in a blind. When all of a sudden, after about 30 seconds of him getting ready to break into the house, this fierce warrior woman opens the window and goes, what are you doing? And he falls back into the yard like, oh, I picked the wrong house to mess with today. After that event, you know, we, we started to think back or think about it because had my wife not been home sick that day, we would have been robbed, plain and simple. There, there was nobody around who saw it. You know, there was nothing going on. And had she not done that, we'd have been robbed. Had, had she not thought that this was a cat playing in a window, 
something else might have happened. I, I shudder to think. And so while this man didn't steal from us anything physically, he absolutely stole a sense of security. Because now my wife was going, can, can I be alone in this house? If we go to church on Sunday, the both of us, and there's no vehicle in the yard, are we going to get robbed? And so about a month later, this handy-dandy door-to-door salesman comes knocking on our door, and he says, we sell security systems. And my wife says, yes. I don't know what it is, but yes. And suddenly, I was robbed of whatever it was. It was like 100 bucks a month that was stolen from my pocket because of this man. Our eighth word is the, based on the eighth commandment. It's Exodus 20, 15. You don't have to turn there because it's literally these few words. Do not steal. And the Bible has a lot to say about theft. In fact, the culture of that day had some rules that people lived by. So if you stole an ox from someone, because that's going to be a common thing today. If you stole an ox and the, you were captured, but you had slaughtered or sold that ox, you had to pay the owner back five times its value. If it was a sheep, you had to pay back four times its value. And if that animal was recovered and returned to the owner, you would still have to pay the owner back twice of its value. And if you couldn't pay the owner back, you were sold into slavery to pay for the debt. So the culture of the biblical world took slavery, I'm sorry, took a theft seriously. In fact, if you were happening to see one of your neighbors being robbed and you stood by and do, did nothing, you were considered partially liable. Even if their stuff sort of floated away somehow and you didn't stop that from happening if it was in your power, then you were considered to be, in some ways, an accessory. Because in the biblical worldview, there is no me, myself, and I, and everybody else is out here. In the biblical worldview, the idea was that all of us are connected to one another. We're all, uh, we have some sort of interconnectedness that, that gives us a reason to watch out for and take care of each other. And so, this idea of theft, this do not steal, it wasn't just a personal fault. It was a community that was surrounded. It was a community. And Jesus came along and he said, you know what, I want something better for you. I want something better for your life because it's not just don't steal because then the security companies are going to sell you this thing that you never use and it's going to cost you lots of money. It's don't steal because we're all made in the image of God. And you're taking not just from them, you're taking from their humanity because out of everything that we lost in that moment of theft that almost happened, we lost a little bit of our faith in our fellow human being. We lost a little bit of hope that we could just leave our house unattended and everyone would say, ah, we'll take care of that. It's not ours, but we'll watch over it. And so Jesus wants something better for us. It's called generosity. And that's our word. Our eighth word is generosity. And the one thought that I want to share that kind of guides the rest of this message is this. Living generously leaves God room to bless you more. Now, I want to clarify that because depending on which channel on the television you hear this message from, it might be followed with, so if you just write a check to God, you just don't, you leave that in the offering plate, you know, that's not this, okay? So stay with me for just a minute. Living generously, though, leaves you room, or leaves God room to pour a blessing into your life. But what does that blessing look like? Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Now, you'll notice we've gone through this verse, so I'm going to focus in on the latter part of it, but, but I do want to set the stage in case you weren't here when we went through this a few months ago, because this theme of generosity keeps coming up. Luke chapter 12, starting in 22, Jesus says to his disciples, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life what you will eat, or about the body, what you will wear. Isn't that where we start most of the time? I'm hungry, and I need clothing, right? 
For the life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a storeroom or a barn, and yet God feeds them. And I love this line. Aren't you worth more than birds? So why do you worry? Can any of you add a moment to his lifespan by worrying? If you're not able to do this little thing, why worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor or spin thread, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass, which is here today and is thrown into the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he do for you? And then he kind of gives us a little admonishment. You have little faith. Don't strive for what you should eat and what you should drink. And don't be anxious. Your heavenly father knows you need these things. For the Gentile world, they seek after that. The Gentiles would be those who didn't believe in God. But look at what it says. If you haven't underlined this in your Bible before, your father knows that you need them. Your father knows that you need them. You see, living generously leaves God room to bless you with more. But maybe it's not the more that you are thinking of. Maybe it's not that mansion. Maybe it's not the brand new car with the spinning rims or whatever you're, you're into. You know, maybe, maybe it looks a little bit differently than that. On your impact guide on page 44, there's a little thought about theft. If you go to the next slide for me. It says, all theft begins with a heart filled with greed. I think we can agree that if you're wanting to steal something, you probably have some motives towards getting money, right? There might be a little bit of greed involved. Now, you know, in the Robin Hood days and, you know, you robbed some bread to feed your family, that, that might be a little different than this. But for, for all theft that we see today, whether it's, you know, electronic, whether it's somebody stealing your identity, it starts with this heart filled with greed. Just like last week. Last week we talked about Jesus saying that lust is an attitude of the heart that thwarts true love. Here we see Jesus starting to point out that greed thwarts something that God wants to do in our lives. But he takes it even deeper because he says, look, let's be honest, greed begins with worry that we won't have enough, right? So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the source of what we have? Is it our paycheck, the person who writes the paycheck, the company that we work for, are they the source of our provision? Or, or is it our own hands? Is it the, by the strength of my brow and the, the power of my bootstraps or something like that, that that I've lifted myself up? Or is it something different? Is it that God generously provides even the strength that's in our body, the air that's in our lungs? And as this verse says, he takes care of us. Look at birds. Look at flowers. What do they do to earn their keep? And yet God watches over these. And if he'll watch over these, won't he watch over you as well? And so then the question has to shift to, if God is the source of our provision, what does enough look like? This past week in preparation for this message, I read a book by the, uh, called More or Less, the author's name is Jeff Schinnebarger. Schinnebacher, I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher his name. I doubt he's watching the live stream, but it'll be okay. But this author went on an experiment. He met a gentleman as he moved into a new neighborhood in Atlanta who identified himself as a neighbor. And he quickly learned that this neighbor, while he lived in that neighborhood, didn't actually have a home. And so... Jeff started this journey where he was talking with this new friend of his, and as he saw what he was worried about versus the little worry that this man had, he started to go on this quest. And so he decided something bold. He told his wife, we are not buying any more food for this house until we've eaten everything that's here that's edible. Now, Jeff, in his book, talks about something I can relate to. He opens the fridge sees dozens of things and goes, honey, we don't have anything to eat. What are we going to do? 
well, Taco Bell's right down the corner. That's where we're going, right? So he forced his family to only eat the things that they had in their cupboards, their freezer, and stuff like that. And his own words, he says, I figured it would take three, four days we'd be out of food. It was almost two months later that they finally went grocery shopping. Jeff then shares the story of how he shared that story with a friend of his, and she became convicted, but not about food. She said, you know what? I have a lot of clothing. Don't worry about food. Don't worry about clothing, right? She said, I have a lot of clothing. In fact, I'm going to do an enough experiment, as they called it, and I am going to not wear the same outfit twice until I've worn everything. And she was like, oh, I have a lot of clothes. This is going to last about a month. 176 days later, she finally repeated an outfit. And so he asks, what is enough and what is excess? And he says, excess is that thing that we could give away today and it wouldn't change a single aspect of our tomorrow. Excess is more than what we need. And in turn, it might just be what someone else needs. So what is enough? Is it enough that we have two months worth of food already provided for us? 176 days worth of clothing? I will admit I counted my shirts. I have 77, coincidentally. So I could go about two months without repeating a piece of clothing. And I'm not even a fashionista, as you can tell. <laughs> what is enough? What is excess? Years ago, there was a man by the name of John Rockefeller. Some of you know that name. Some of you, you know, maybe have heard of that in the past. He was essentially the, the Amazon of his day. He was Jeff Bezos, right? And it's been estimated that in today's dollars, John Rockefeller had about $310 billion in his personal portfolio. That's a lot of zeros, that's a lot of Taco Bell, you know, no matter how you shake it out, he could do whatever he wanted. And there was a, an interview that happened, and the question came up to John, Mr. Rockefeller, what is enough? And I think his response just absolutely sums up my attitude half the time. Just a little more. So if the man who had $310 billion to his name thought that enough was just a little more, can we see how this heart of greed and worry gets into us? There was an interview done with multimillionaires in 2015, and they asked them, how much more would you need to be happy? And we're talking people who have tens, twenties, hundreds of millions of dollars. You know what the answer was? 25% more. If we just had 25% more, we'd be happy. But that was the same answer from the person with 10 million, 200 million, and apparently even $310 billion. Jesus tells us that this, this heart attitude that presents itself as greed but starts in worry, it impacts our lives. It impacts how we treat others, and it even impacts our relationship with God. Hop back into Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 30, where we left off. And you'll see in that, that verse, in verse 30, he says, your heavenly Father knows your needs. So in this root of worry, we have to understand that, that God himself is unreasonably loving towards us. He knows our needs. So then it goes on to say, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father, and I want you to underline this next word if you haven't, delights, delights to give you the kingdom. It's not just that God wants you to have enough. He delights to give you even more than you can handle it just might not look like the same thing that John Rockefeller was after. He says, sell your possessions, give to the poor, make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old. And again, look at this word, an inexhaustible treasure. We think about 
Rockefeller's pile of cash, the Scrooge McDuck swimming through a pool of money, even that's exhaustible. Jesus wants to give us an inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief, not there, that's my spelling mistake, comes, to ne- comes near and no moth destroys. And then he says this, which we talked about as the focus point last time on this, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So if your treasure is in more, your heart's going to be consumed with more. If your treasure is in I don't have enough, your heart is going to say, I need more. I've got to get there. I've got to keep striving. I've either got to wear myself out, wear my fingers to the bone, or maybe if I just do a little of this and a little of that, I can get somebody else's more. Jesus tells us where our treasure is. That's where our heart is going to go. But look at what it says in there. God delights to give us more. He just wants to give us more of the things that are going to make a real difference in our lives. He doesn't want to give us more and more like Rockefeller where we say, okay, if I just have this little bit more, it's going to be enough. Or the millionaires who say, if I just have 25%, that's the magic number, guys, 25% more. He says, I want to give you an inexhaustible treasure. And notice what he says. If you seek first the kingdom, all those things you worry about, the clothing, the food, that'll be provided for you. What God wants to give us is something even greater. On page 44 of your impact guide, in the sermon notes there, you see this little blurb. It says, worry, anxiety, and fear are put to death. Put to death when we live generously. What does it mean to live generously? Well, as Shinnebarger discovered in his book, some of the things he had laying around that he hadn't used in months were the exact things his homeless neighbor needed to survive to keep his lawnmower business going. So this doesn't necessarily, generosity doesn't necessarily mean you have to sell your house and, you know, go become Mother Teresa. You know, you don't have to, although we need more of those in the world, but that doesn't necessarily have to be your path. Generosity is an attitude of the heart. It's something that we come on as we ask ourselves the question, is God big enough to provide for us? And if there's one group of people in the history of humanity that has been defined by generosity, it's those who are called by the kingdom. Now, I don't have time in the next few minutes to run through all the nuances of what the kingdom of God meant, so I'm going to co-opt it for just a second and use the word church. Because the church is not a building. It meets in a building. it's, It's not a place. It's a people of God. It's the people that he was speaking to when he says, don't worry about these things but seek a better treasure. And historically, throughout humanity's history, the church has stepped up in generosity. It's because of the words of Jesus lived out through the actions of the church that we have hospitals. It's because of the words of Jesus lived out through the actions of the church that we have what has become our modern-day school system. It's because of the words of Jesus lived out through the actions of the generosity of the church That we no longer leave unwanted children out in the cold or in the heat to die. But instead we take them in. We bring them into our homes. We bring them into a system that is imperfect, yes. But it's designed to take care of others. The church has always been a source of generosity. So I want to talk to you for just a moment I try and do these little reminders just every few months because Sloan's Lake Church is about to hit another milestone. We're about to become 131 years old this winter. And for the last 130 years, we've been defined at different seasons by generosity. As I've reminded you, our very first act was one of generosity that started the church. And we're in this transition. I keep telling the elders, I say, right now is is a critical moment for people, and you need to hear this. I'm just being honest as your pastor. We're not what we were, 
We still hold the history, right? We still have, you know, Ed and, and Gordon and Alan and Steve are all going to be putting a little blurb in the annual report, but we're not what we were, which is a good thing in some ways. You know, as I was being hired on, the, the chair of the search team or the chair of the board, one of the two told me, he said, Lee, honestly, we're about two years away from closing the doors. That's about where the church is at. So we're not where we were, but we're also not yet where we're going. And so we're in this awkward middle point where for some who, who want things to go back the way they were, we're not there. And for some who come and visit for the first time, we're not there. So we're in this awkward middle. We've had about 11 funerals since I've gotten here, and that luckily stopped a few months ago. So if everybody could just quit dying, I, I like the trend so far. But we had about 11 funerals We've, we've seen new families come in. We've seen, you know, new life, new energy, but we're still in this awkward phase. And as a part of that, you know, our church has had some struggles. I've, I've mentioned before, but we've, we've frozen the ministry budgets. I don't know if you know how churches are funded, but your giving is what allows us to do ministry. And sometimes that ministry looks like keeping lights on. And that doesn't seem like it's that important, but if the lights aren't on, when we open up the severe weather shelter here in a few weeks, we don't have lights, we don't have heat, that speaks ministry to people. And so I, I talked with the elders board and I said, look, at, if, if things kind of are in this mode as we keep going, then I, I, we've got we've to come up with something. And the board, you know, treasurer, those talked to me, they said, look, Lee, we, we've got to figure out some moves. I've mentioned before, we were in a spot where we had to think bold. And so I told him, I said, look, we've cut ministry. We're running on a paper thin on that side of things. So if there's something else left, it's, it's staffing. And you know what? I'm, I'm unwilling to see our staff that we've hired in go. So why don't you let me go get a job? And I'll just, I'll put it towards the ministry of the church. And so that was early summer. Luckily, we have not had to go that route. And, you know, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. I feel very blessed by a board of elders who looked at me and said, no, stop it. You already are here too much. You only see your family when they're here in the building. Like, no, stop it. So we haven't had that happen. But the reality is, if we're going to have a transformational impact in our city, we've got to start to look at what it means to be generous again. And this might sound like a ploy, you know, give money to the church this isn't that. I've said it before. If you feel like I'm trying to just get money, give it to another church. But give it to the church. Because in so many ways, the church in our city, whether it's Park Church or, or whether it's Cloverdale, whether it's Red Rocks or Flatirons, that is the embodiment of what it looks like to bring the kingdom of God on this planet. But I don't happen to believe that Sloan's Lake Church's history is going to end in a couple years. In fact, I believe this next season is going to be even more impactful. And I believe that God has been showing us in just some little ways how that could be. A couple months ago, I mentioned the Emerge Grant. How we, out of four churches in the United States, were selected to receive a grant to begin to update our facility in some more ways. All of the other churches on that list, the other three, were church plants. Sloan's Lake is the only one who's an existing church. And they said, here's the deal. We'll give you $40,000. You have to raise $40,000. Now, for many of us, I've had people say, like, Lee, why aren't you asking the congregation to give more? Because I don't want that to be the message ongoing. And I also want us to understand that we are going to step into a giving campaign, into a vision campaign. Because it's not just focused on giving, it's focused on reaching our city. And so in a few weeks at the annual business meeting, and then again as we move into the holiday season, I'm going to start talking about this vision campaign. But I want you to know why I believe God's ready to show up. Because without going to the congregation and saying, hey, y'all just need to give more, just sign that check, you know, none of that. We had five different people, one of which a church in Wyoming who stepped up and said, we'll cover that for you. We have completed the Emerge Grants. It is done. We have $80,000 that's come in. Now, I want you to hear this the proper way because you hear, oh, cool, we got $80,000, everything is good. That money is specifically given for specific purposes. We can't use it to fund the ministry. We can't restart the budget and keep doing things, but we are going to be able to go down to the kids' ministry area and revitalize some more. 
We're going to redo some more stuff with the youth ministry area. We're going to do a couple things in the sanctuary where maybe you don't even see it. Like the cables that run through here are messed up, and that's one of the reasons we, why sometimes the volume gets a little wonky. We're going to fix some of Yeah, nice one. <laughs> nice one. Ha! That was not a cabling issue. <laughs> That was an operator issue. <laughs> so we're going to fix some of those things, but that doesn't mean we're out of the woods. So I want to ask you and invite you to pray in this season, because coming up, just a couple months, we're going to start a generosity campaign. I've already told you, and I told the elders, I said, I just stood in front of the church as a senior pastor and sold them, told them I'm going to sell my comic books. I am. I'm going to sell my comic books to go towards it. Because I believe in the ministry, not just of the church, but of this church, if I had wanted to take a different path in life, I could have. I was a senior accounts manager at Dell. I was making a good amount of money then, and within 18 months, I would have been in a position where I would not have seen under six figures again in that company. And I went to be a youth pastor for a 40% pay cut. That's not the pathway you take if you're wanting riches, right? But it's because I believe in the future of the church. I believe in the future of the ministry that's going to happen in Denver over this next 20 years. And so you'll hear me say it at the campaign, but we're working towards year 150. This is year one. We've got a way to, ways to go, and I want to ask you to continue to support the church, whether it's through giving, whether it's through you know, just saying, hey, the music isn't what I, I prefer, but look at how we're reaching the younger generation. Whether it's through just talking with people and saying, hey, have you heard about my church? We, we attend Sloan's Lake Church. Where is it? It's at Sloan's Lake. It's very convenient. Just invite people over because I believe God's going to do some amazing things through the work of the church, not me, this body together. And so I want to invite you on your next step here to begin a prayer process because in any turnaround church, in any situation where change starts to get heavy as it has been with us and it has to continue to be over time, prayer is what makes the difference. So I want to invite you into five minutes of prayer at the start of each day, and just asking God how you can live more generously. Maybe that's something to the church. Maybe that's those extra clothes you have laying around that you give to the poor. Maybe it's giving a couple weekends to the homeless ministry or severe weather shelter. What does generosity look like for you? Because I'll tell you this, when you shift your heart from excess to generosity, God starts to show up in powerful ways. And you start to have those stories of how you changed someone else's life. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, God, take away the worry from our hearts that we just won't have enough. Whether we have a, a shack or a mansion, whether we've got money in our pockets or we're not sure where our next meal is going to come from, Remind us, Jesus, that we live in America where if we make more than 30000 a year, we're in the top 7% of all human beings on the planet in terms of income. Help us to be reminded of how much you've blessed us and teach our heart to seek better things as we pray today and as we pray throughout this week. Not more food, not more clothing, not more of things that are going to pass away tomorrow, but more of your kingdom changing people's lives in our life groups, in, our, in the ways we serve, and even, yes, in the ways we give. And Jesus, as the pastor here, I just, I pray a prayer of thanks that you brought me to this congregation. I am so thankful for the many people who have continued to support the ministry, who have continued to give selflessly, serve selflessly, and all those who have continued to say, you know what, this isn't what it was, but we have a new marching order to reach our community. Thank you, Jesus. Continue to show us the kingdom and how it can show up and invade our very lives and our very moments. We love you, Jesus. Amen.